Now, this episode, I uh, I realize we've been talking about how to talk to people for so long. Um, I wanted to do a, a podcast on how to be the right person. And in the in the tech world, and I don't know if it's this way in like attorney with attorneys or other trade professions, but in the tech world, uh, there's this issue where you get this really great technician or a really great engineer, and they're like, "Man, my boss is making a lot of money off of me. I uh-huh. should start my own company." <laughs> and yep. So they thought, they think, "How hard could it be? I'm going to go hard could it be? work. Yep. I get the check, and I make all the money." And it's very simple. So $150, you know, it's great, you know, per hour, whatever the going rate is for your MSP. And then you then you keep working that and you can't figure out why you're not making any money. It's five years down the road. Uh, you're stressed. You're working all the time and you cannot figure out what what you're doing wrong. Like, how do I grow? How do I get to the point where like I am not working 24-7? I'm actually enjoying my life. Yep. And I, so, I uh that's the core of this episode here. How do you go from an engineer to a leadership? Yep. It kind of related little phrase I've heard before. I heard it again recently. Uh, and it was, if you're tired of working 40 hours a week for someone else, start your own business and work 80 hours a week for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's so true. Like, you know, we whether your history as an owner is like you got burned out of corporate and decided to start an MSP or you were working for another MSP and they were doing everything wrong and you decide your own. Or maybe you work for a really great MSP that just said, hey, you know what? we got a bunch of smaller clients we want to siphon off. Do you want to start your own MSP and kick off with them? Yeah. Whatever it is, it, you know, you were not trained to be a leader. And I took a class one time, I think it was called Snapshots of Great Leadership or something like that. It's from an MBA. And uh, they said, there's no defining feature that makes you a leader. Like you look at Napoleon, you look at, uh, you know, like the great leaders of our time, like JFK or anybody that's considered a great leader. Um, And what made them a leader, there's no common thread through all of them. And I I like to disagree. A common thread of a great leader is somebody who gets how to use their people appropriately. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. I think the bet one, two of the best pieces of advice I ever got that helped me transition from being a really hardworking engineer to a great leader was uh, one was run the called play, whether you agree with it or not. So if you're in a, if you're in a meeting with other people and you all decide to do something, run that play, even if it wasn't yours. If you said, no, no, it's going it, to, it's going to do terrible things for us. No, run it, be a unified front. Um, the second thing was, you know, study your people and see what they're good at and then get out of their way. You know, well, and that's, I think the, the people element is, is really important because I think sometimes, and so I've in no grand scale, uh, I have fallen into that serial entrepreneur route, right? A lot of little businesses that I've started, little things that we've done. Um, and they've, they've been okay. I've been happy to do them. Um, you know, kind of a hobby thing. I've started out with the right approach. I've learned this because you're going to be able to do so much yourself and then you're going to need other people. And if you don't have an understanding of how you are going to get those people or manage those people, really leverage, you know, and, and utilize those people, you, you need to be careful about starting out on your own. Uh, I think what happens sometimes, especially the engineers, they think, oh, yeah, you know, I can do all this technical work and I only need three customers and I can, you know, make everything happen. And I've got these three guys that I can start with and, and I'll all be good. If you're starting your business with zero growth anticipation, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And so if you, you know, are going to say, hey, I don't want to fail, I'm going to grow. Well, how are you going to grow? Are you individually going to be able to do everything that that business needs? Then perhaps you can, but rarely can we do everything. And that's when the people element really starts coming up. Who is going to help you out in this? You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. 
And that's why you treat your clients like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. What a dig. You know, we always look at uh, the, the current level of management. We say, man, they really just don't know what they're doing. They're just terrible. Like, how did they get there? Why is it toxic? And so what we've been talking about for the past like five minutes is company culture. Engineers do not pay attention to culture. Some of you, you know, immediately go, oh, I want a culture that does this. Cool. But you didn't look at why and how an MSP got to be the way it was. And what were the pitfalls? Like, what were, why is this company running the way it is today? And think, how are you going to avoid similar traps? Because there are, as an entrepreneur, there are a million things you don't know. And you can talk to anybody who's run a successful business. And we all have this story about the school of hard knocks that we had to go through. And we're continuously going through. And it, the question is, if you could pay $80,000 to avoid the school of hard knocks and come out with all the knowledge you needed, would you do it? And I've never heard somebody say yes. That's true. They all true. think, like, while they were going through the pain, of growth, the pain of learning. They learned so much that made them into the leader they needed to be. And so I remember like when I was younger, I was like, oh man, leadership doesn't know what it's doing. Well, it was different for me because back then IT leadership was not IT because there were no IT leaders in the late nineties, early two thousands. They came from other departments. I was managed by an accounting leader. I was managed by a, you know, pick the area of the business where somebody was wanted to move up in management. And so they were a manager, but they didn't get the whole picture. They, they were still learning as well. Now we're sitting here 20 years later and we're all, we're all finding these, these engineers, some who have made the successful transition into leadership and somebody who, some who went into leadership and never learned what it meant to be a good leader. And so when you're making that transition, I usually ask somebody like, are you working in the business as a working manager? Or are you learning how to work on the business as an administrator? And if you are scared by meetings and and spending your day in a meetings with people, do not become an administrator. Yeah, no. Do not an administrator's either. job is to meet with people, empower them, and watch them walk out the door. Yes. If you need to work on things yourself, if that is part of your core happiness and who you are, do not become an administrator. Stay an engineer. It's a happy little world down there. Not little. It's it's a happy world. <laughs> you know, but like for me, like I say, I don't mind sitting in meetings with these people who like have like resources and deliverables. And, you know, I met with met with some really big people yesterday and it was great talking to them and coming up with ideas and then realizing that now I've got to empower people to, to, to help create this vision. And so you're, you're painting, but you're just telling somebody, I want this kind of painting so I can put it next to this one. And then we're going to make these two put together. So my moniker online when I was an engineer was called, or my handle online was called digital blacksmith because in, I think it was a slash dot form. I heard somebody explain it like, I feel like I'm a bit of a digital blacksmith. We're creating this plane. None of the parts work together. So we're like welding disparate things. And eventually we're making this really cool item that was not meant to fly. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. not meant. Yeah, that's it. What we're doing with digital assets. I feel like that is when I started turning my life from being an engineer. Like I did, it wasn't that I liked working on technology so much, which I do. It was architecting solutions. Yes. And back and going, Oh, look at that. Yeah. I created something. Yeah. Creating things and solving problems. And, you know, that's, you have to understand what you like to do. And if, if you are the techie guy and you think, you know, um, me and my buddy, you know, we can start this business. We're both great, you know, technical resources. Uh, we're going to start a tech company and we're just going to do tech stuff, right? that's that's not going to be right. You're going to have a lot of other activities, a lot of other needs that need to be met outside of just that technology element. Yes. And you've got to be prepared to do that. So an interesting little analogy on this or perhaps example on this, um, 
one of the YouTube channels. It's technology focused that I kind of follow along with. Uh, so he's a YouTuber and he put out this video. Why does a YouTuber have a staff of 80, right? So 80 people on staff for a YouTube channel. And you're thinking, yeah, why? And so maybe it's a little clickbait there for me. It got me interested. And so I'm watching this because, you know, I see this guy. He's he's just doing tech stuff. They're diving into this stuff. Why does this work? They you know, open up, do all the, the, the cool technology YouTube stuff. But then he begins to open the door to everything that is behind those videos, the research, the writing, uh, all the audio video work, the editing that goes into it. Uh, they've gotten to the point now where they have so much material coming in and out that they need logistics and warehousing. Well, why would a YouTuber need a warehouse? You know, because they've got so much going on there. And so that's great success. But if you don't start out at the very beginning, understanding that you are going to need a social media person or something. And, yeah. you know, and I say that because a lot of engineers are like, yeah, I do my social stuff, but I don't, I don't need to be, you know, out there and doing marketing or advertising or social engagements. That's not me. Well, you're going to need that because that's part of, you know, the modern marketplace. The, You've got to be prepared in, for that. The tech industry is strewn with solutions that were the best in the market, but could not sell themselves. And you got you've got to work that angle and you got to understand the angle as an engineer. You can be the best engineer on the planet. You could be the best at what you do. Let's say you're local. You are the best solution provider in the entire town. But if you don't network and you don't market and show your value, if your clients and people in your city or locale don't believe you are the best. There is no difference between you and the charlatan down the road who just figured out how to do things in his in his basement on his free time. Yep. And There's no difference. Great, great market. Person over promising and under delivering are, is gonna is gonna is gonna win out over you every time. So then you're gonna end up in a low bid game. You're gonna try to beat people by offering the lowest prices in town, and that is a losing game. Absolutely. Because you didn't learn administration. You, know, you work didn't to death. learn how to sell and market and all these hundred other things there are. To running a business you can't just be an engineer even you know unless you've got like a big whale client so i've seen it happen a couple of times where people tell a story about the, the, the first couple of clients they had a one whale yep. and when that whale went away if it goes away you see this msp crumble mm -hmm. but sometimes you see somebody who had a whale and that whale allowed that engineer that three years to learn the lessons, the runway, yes, and gave them that runway so they could go through the school of hard knocks and start and they start realizing, wait a minute, man, if this if this if this whale goes away, uh, these five employees are gone. I got to find some way to make my portfolio wider. Uh, how do I do that? Oh, I need to. Where, where do I find? It? And so they start getting advice from uh, people. They start moving things in directions that make more sense. And after a while. They've got a ton of things under their belt that that help them survive when the whale leaves. And they're this wiser person after a few years. Some people just never learn that lesson. They end up as break fix the rest of their lives. And they're happy doing that. But you 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 knew who you were. But when you're in engineering, you got to start thinking, why are my leaders the way they are? Is it because they're grade A jerks? Is it because they're jaded? Um, what is it and how do you avoid the same pitfalls and how are you going to grow so that you understand what to do? Like today I am spending my day doing taxes and receipts and going through finances and trying to figure out what we're doing. And, you know, I'll send skip a message in Slack, like freaking taxes just crush me, you know, like it's, but these are things I have to do. It's not engineering. It's not meetings. It's not leadership, but it is. It has to be done until I can find somebody to delegate it to full time. And so as a leader, you got to think, what things can I ship off to somebody who's better at this than me? What things do I take in internally? And the things that you take in internally as a leader need to be administrative, not engineering based. So your, your operations should not be run by your leadership. 
or you should be working your direction to do that. And I've always said this, a successful leader at the end of the day should sit back and be bored. Yeah, I would say that's right. And that way, a successful leader can work on the business and say, okay, where are we doing well? What can we do better? Where are our opportunities to grow the company? So while people are running the company, the successful administrator should be sitting back and finding opportunities for growth, which is which is what I I try desperately to 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 get into at, at Virtual C Humanize IT here. I, I talk to Sebastian, Skip, and and all the all the people in our on our teams all the time. But like I, I the more bored I am, the more opportunities I get to find. But if I spend all my day building things inside the software, if I spend all my day in the community, then I spend less time um, finding these opportunities and these new partner programs and the big hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar deals. I, I spend less time doing that, and so um, and then over time, like I'll find a community manager who starts looking for that stuff for me. But I got to figure out who we are first. I've got to figure out like social media wise. If you asked me like three years ago when we hired our first social media person, like, oh, they're going to do this for us. Cool. It's been three years. How much money have I spent on social media management? And I think I can do this better. So, you know, we're revamping how we do that. How do we engage? How do we do things? But sometimes leaders can get lost in the process that they're just checking off boxes and are doing things, but they're not figuring out why. That means you're working on the business and or working in the business, not on the business. Yeah. Because I'm checking the box off. I did my social media post on Tuesday. I'm done. Okay. Well, you started that process three years ago. Why did you do it on Tuesdays? What content are you putting up there on Tuesdays? What are you hoping to get out of that? What are you getting out of it? You've done it, but what did you get out of it? Yep. That's exactly. So while I'm doing my finances, I'm sitting here going, we spent what? And I look down and go, did we get an ROI on that? And because I'm bored, I'm I'm throwing up a show onto the side because my my ADHD brain will go bonkers if I just stare at a code all day or stare at taxes all day. While I'm sitting there looking at this expense, I'm like, did we get what we want out of this or should I cut that out of the budget? If I had spent today instead working on um, content and delivery, I wouldn't have spent that time thinking through my finances and am I spending in the right places? So, and that's something that's something you can do now. So if you're an engineer at, you know, some tech firm in any any sort of category and you're thinking, you know, I can do this. Well, start doing that. Um, start finding those opportunities to dive in there. You know, maybe your company's got a new product and we really and, and they need some engineering help on a real cost analysis. What is going to be the cost of launching this product on average how many hours is, you know is it going to take what's the material or the licensing or the product cost you know there's a million things that start going into that and, and start diving in and if that's something that you know you enjoy and like yeah i can do this and you know then i come back do my technical work then i can shift gears and and go do some of the more creative elements and shift back again then then maybe, you know, you might be one of those candidates who could jump out there and do that. But if you look at that and go, oh, God, I can't stand any of that. I just want to work. You know, I just want to log in get my hands on the keyboard and just log in and, you know, I don't know, do whatever what subnets, right? Yeah. You know, whatever that is, then that should be a pretty, you know, big red flag that, you know, maybe you shouldn't go down this route. You know, I remember it was mid 2000s somewhere like I got passed over for a uh, leadership position and uh, I was feeling pretty bad for myself. And I, and I got to think of myself like, why do I want to move into leadership? And I, I honestly I had to tell myself, well, it's because that's how you, that's how the corporate world works. You, you move into leadership. At the time, I had a lot of opportunity in front of me. I was I was I had my own like moonlighting uh, break fix shop that I was working with. And uh, kind of considering transitioning into an MSP or keeping my corporate job and doing it. And I had to really ask myself, what is it that I actually want to do with my life? Am I going to be happy just being an engineer? Now, I shouldn't say just. Am I happy 
working on these PCs, uh, you know, busting knuckles on uh, random random uh, boards here and there, uh, solving solutions and architecting solutions. And it was a hard question for me because I really like that stuff. I loved sitting there and putting together the old boxes. I loved working on servers. I loved cracking open a new firewall and seeing what was inside and how they laid it out. It just, it was fun to me. But then I really had to sit down and think, do I want to run an MSP? Now, at the time, they weren't called MSPs. Do I want to run a consulting agency? And I could not make it work. Um, there weren't enough engineers for me to hire that were also interested in doing that. And so I wasn't, I couldn't make the math work. That was my first foy into thinking of leadership. Could I have made a good amount of money? Because I was making a killing moonlighting, by the way. Um, you know, but could I have made a lot of money as a, as a consultant back in the mid 2000s? Oh, yeah. But I would not have traveled to Spain. I wouldn't have done half the things I got to do in my free time as a corporate junkie. Yeah. Because I had spare time. Yeah. I think it was a wise decision. But what I decided was by it took me a couple of years to really come to grips with it. Like what I really liked was problem solving. And I thought, I like this no matter what. And playing board games. I love board games where I have to like put together a strategy watch it come together and come to fruition at the end. Like deck builder games are fantastic this way. You start off with 10 cards and by the end you have 30 or 40 and you've, you know, you're playing uh, and you, and you finally like get your, get your rhythm going and you're just dominating everyone. So all these other people took short term wins to get their victory points. And I was doing nothing. And all of a sudden, like it starts ramping up. I start getting more and more victory points. And by the end, you got this thing that's working well together. I that's I find that really, really rewarding. And so I realized that, you know what, in management, you're putting all these disparate pieces together, but at a higher level. I'm putting this engineer, a network engineer over here. I'm putting a sysadmin here. I'm putting a uh, server engineer here. I'm putting a desktop support here. And I'm going to train them each in these different ways so they work this way. So that when we get this giant project over here, the engine is running and ready to chew out this, this solution. That is really rewarding on an administration level. But an engineer will just think, how do I sell firewalls faster? How do I deploy a firewall faster? They'll write a script to do it. That's an engineer solution. An engineer moving into administration will start thinking of their people like components to a, a network. How do you build this network so it all works together to provide solutions for what you're trying to do? And that's the transition from engineer to leadership. What are the components you're looking at? If you're a leader still looking at firewalls, still looking at servers, you're a managing, you're, you're, you're a working manager. You're, you're yep. not really the same. That's the classification, yeah, working manager. Yep. Which is why a lot of these, I think these sales guys who become MSP leaders do well because you can be crappy at networking, but great at sales and be successful. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, the reverse isn't true. If you are great at networking, but crappy at sales, you will fail. Absolutely. Unless you get lucky. And so I think with an engineer, I really would like for people to think, as you're moving up through leadership, do you like working with people? Do you like empowering people so that they can do things for you? Right now, you're an engineer. You're building servers. You're building assets to do a job for the business. Can you do that same thing with people? Can you raise them up and make them better than you so that you don't do the job? Do you need them to be just like you? That's a big red flag. That is. That is a huge red flag. <laughs> yes. When you, when you begin bringing these other people on, you know, back to setting expectations, you've got to think from the very beginning... I need some people to do this because I don't want to do it. So why would you hire someone just like you to do something that you don't want to do? Right. So yeah. you're going to have to hire people that are different than you, people with different taste and perspectives. And that's going to be the valuable element at it. But if you have trouble working with people that aren't like you and you can't adapt to their different tastes and perspectives, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. And one of the things I want to leave this podcast on is like finding great engineer leaders is weird in our field. And, and it's because of this. A great engineer does not automatically make a great, a great leader. 
but our KPIs for engineers, like who's your high performer uh, employee? Oh, I should promote them in the management. There's an entire entire yeah. book written on this. Many books yeah. written on this. It's called The Peter Principle. If you take an engineer and you keep promoting them because they do a good job, eventually you're going to promote them into a position where they do a bad job. You, you are, you are pro in the corporate world, you are promoted to your area of, of most ineffectiveness. That is the rule. Because then you don't get promoted anymore. You didn't get promoted because there was a different set of skills you needed. You got promoted because you're good at your existing job. You'd be better at this upper level job. This is not true in engineering. It is almost the opposite. Sometimes your worst engineers are your best leaders because they're not the ones focused on detail. They're focused on the people and so they forget things. So when you have a leadership role, you look at it differently. This person should exhibit these behaviors. Do they need to know how to be the best at a firewall admin? No, they need to be able to relate to firewall admins. That's, Do they that's need to be the best important. server provisioning person? No, they need to be able to relate to those people and understand how to empower them. And so when you look at engineering leadership or any kind of leadership in the technical arena, you want to put people in leadership that aren't necessarily great engineers. You want to put people in leadership who are great leaders, who are great delegators, who are great at relationships. That's who you want in leadership, which is why we look at managers sometimes and go, man, that person's incompetent. You're right. They are a terrible firewall administrator. You know what they're really great at? Making sure you get paid. You're really great at making sure that you get next Wednesday off and somebody's not going to override your, your day off schedule. They're going to make sure that they deflect people around your schedule because you're going through a hard time in life right now. That's what they're good at. They can see that you have been late. You've been, you've been dropping the ball on your, on your activities and they're going to help ease your load and redirect your load so that you can get through whatever you're going through. An engineer will just yell at you. Say, why are you getting your crap done? Because they don't see you as a person. They see you as, a, as somebody like themselves who should be getting their work done. They don't see the divorce you're going through. They don't see the, the kid is in the hospital. They don't see that stuff. They see a job to be done. A people manager, a leader looks at their people and says, what is the most effective way for this person to work? What's a healthy environment for them? If you, for, if you hire a Cisco uh, administrator, and you give them a checkpoint or you give them a FortiGate, they're gonna be okay. But why not craft the environment to start doing Cisco work? You've got the great engineer, they're gonna be good at it. There's a million reasons why. Uh, now that's why leadership is complicated. Why did you hire a Cisco engineer when you're a checkpoint shop? <laughs> Now I think Cisco, I think Cisco engineers get well along well with Checkpoint, but that's that's another conversation for another day. But as a leader, are you creating an environment where your people can be successful? Or are you trying to create take people and make them successful in your environment? That's a, a hard question for everyone. So older institutions have more mature environments. And it's harder to bend the institution to the person. So you gotta make sure you hire the right person for the environment. For small agile MSPs, like if you're under a hundred employees, you can start bending your environment to fit a great yes. employee. Yeah, you can. Where are they going to be successful and then hire somebody else for the role or delegate the uh, roles they're not good at to other people. That is leadership. You're now thinking about the person versus the process. Yeah. And if you're that engineer thinking, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do this, I'm going to start this. Th there's many great that come out. I'm not trying to dissuade anyone. I'm just trying to say, make oh, yeah. sure <laughs> make, well, make sure you're prepared. All right. If, if you think, hey, I'm going to start my own business because this is all I want to do. I want to focus on just this. I'm tired of filling out my TPS reports or whatever. They're a waste <laughs> of time. My three bosses. <laughs> yeah, you've got to you've got to really double check yourself there or you're going to end up in an even worse situation where you're doing even less of what you really want to do because of the business is demanding so much more from you. So be careful on those. Yeah. If you want to be a leader, lead people, look behind you. Who's following you naturally. Um, if you want to be a lead, if you want to be a great engineer, 
work in a corporation, work for a great MSP and shine and do what you do well. And then you don't have to worry about meetings. You don't have to worry about all this stuff. But if you love working with people, you love empowering and delegating and helping people succeed and building something structurally with human beings, that's where you come in the leadership because you have to lead something to be a leader. And that's where I have to get, that's what I have for you guys. Engineering to leadership is hard because just because you're great at fixing things doesn't mean you're great at fixing and delegating to people. And that's, and that's, that's the message for today. Thanks for coming on, Skip. Uh, great episode. And you know, I, I might expand this a little bit more, like, you know, make some personal stories about how we became leaders, how we kind of like evolved and kind of the do's and the don'ts. That might be a great episode for the future. All right. But I've got a few of the time, don'ts. Stay tuned. Do the uh, don't side. Great, yep. We're going to have some great speakers on this next quarter. Uh, you know, we've got some great people coming up and I'm excited to share them once I finally get them committed and recorded. So All thanks, right. Skip. We'll see you, you guys later.